right, next up on Big Talk from Small Libraries 2017 is um, David Gallen Parisi. Did I pronounce that right? I didn't even ask. Yep. Yeah, you did. Cool. All right. <laughs> and he is from San Antonio, Texas, um, the St. Anthony Catholic High School there. And he has been doing uh, some work on getting feedback from his students. And uh, good looking out, crucial feedback from students. So he's going to tell us a little about um, how he has been able to get their input on uh, what they're doing in the library. So I'll just hand over to you, David, to take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Krista. Um, yeah, I'm David Gallen Parisi. Oftentimes people just call me David GP or even Mr. GP because they can't pronounce my last name, but Krista, you actually <laughs> said it beautifully, so right on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I tried. So yeah, and thanks for having me present. Thanks to the Association for Rural and Small Libraries, and then thanks to the Nebraska Library Commission, too. Really appreciate it and I'm excited to present. Um, so let's get started. The, yeah, the talk is on the, on the screen right there. <laughs> and um, what this presentation is going to be about, um, a little bit of an intro and about my school, and then why student feedback is important probably one of the most important parts of the presentation comes right at the beginning. Um, and then having lots of different options for getting feedback and um, receiving feedback are always good. I'll share some official survey techniques that you all are probably familiar with. And I'll also share some unofficial survey techniques, um, which you might be familiar with too, about um, waking people up from naps in the library or moving around furniture. Um, and then at the end, we'll hit some stuff about just small, everyday information gathering and another bonus feature about um, kind of getting people's voice into the library with music playlists. Um, if we have time to get to that, we'll, we'll cover that. So yes, let's get started. Um, so I'm a librarian. Um, I've been a school librarian for about three years. Before that, I was a public librarian. Um, for three years working in teen services and my whole professional career I've been working in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I'm also an artist. I trained as a uh, sculptor mostly because when you do sculpture, uh, when people say like, oh, what do you make as an artist? And you say sculpture, it can cover so many different things. So my sculptures would include uh, zines and comics and installations and just like a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and that's kind of influenced how I work as a librarian too. Um, I found a quote from a zine maker just talking about how they've influenced you and a lot of it is not being afraid to be yourself and then embracing the mistakes that happen. And that's something that has come in handy too when getting feedback from students. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's another part about my identity. Uh, actually, too, can you before you jump on and yeah. introduce your presentation? Somebody did ask. Can you um, explain what a zine is? Yeah, I can. A uh, zine. Um, so it's 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 a thing that's been around for a while. It originated in around the 1980s, and the, the word comes from fanzine. And it's when people would make their own magazines as like tribute to something or as a way to capture their feelings or ideas. They're very ephemeral. They're usually just made on a photocopier. They're not meant to be like permanent books. They're usually just like folded and stapled or even just folded. And then they're given to people. Sometimes people have to pay for them. Sometimes they're for free. They're just kind of like a small booklet thing that you can make. Um, kind of like a, a labor of love, something that you're really into, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something mm -hmm. you're really into. And it can be anything from poetry, it can be photos, it can be stuff that you've collected on the, on on your walks every day or like riding the subway every day. Um, there's just, it can be almost any type of topic that you could think of. Um, and then you just make it and get it out there and usually it doesn't last very long, but that's kind of part of it. <laughs> yeah, so personally created and published, not professional magazine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that's always good. I, I always forget about asking about that. I, I know lots of librarians that do work with zines, and they have a big connection to the library world where some libraries will actually have a zine collection, um, but it's always good to explain it because 
whenever, even today when I say that to students, they're like, what is a zine, Mr. GP? <laughs> and I have to tell them, or we've, we've made some here, and then, then they, they get it right away. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, go ahead. All right, so I work in San Antonio, Texas at a pretty small high school called St. Anthony Catholic High School, um, grades 9 through 12, a little bit under 400 students. Uh, I'm the only librarian and the only library staff person here, so um, that makes it challenging to get all of my stuff done that I have to do, and I kind of have to do things in lots of different ways, I guess. <laughs> um, the last presentation was talking about scheduling tweets and scheduling posts for social media, and I should totally do that. That would make my life a lot easier. Um, but yeah, it's a really, really awesome school. The students are phenomenal, and the teachers are really caring and loving, and it, uh, it's just a great place to be at. So I'm glad to be here. That's convenient for my work-life balance as well. Um, so yeah. All right, let's 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 go on to the actual presentation here. Here's a, a picture of my library. Um, this is kind of uh, the usual setup of it. However, I should say that it changes a lot. Um, as you can see right now, at, at, in the picture, there's just tables. Um, there, there'll be, I'll show you some computers on the side in a little bit, too. Um, and it's just like one big room. It used to be a chapel. Uh, the building was actually built in 1904, and it was previously the school's uh, chapel, but then they converted it into a library. They added the really hideous drop ceiling, and then the back actually goes up pretty high and still has a really beautiful um, like two-story um, just open area. So that's kind of um, where I work. Now I have some animated GIFs that show more of my library, too. Our library signage, right when you walk in, we print it on our 3D printer. We have some students working on computers. Um, we have really, really big tables in our library that are pretty hard to move around, but we still move them around a lot anyway. Um, but they're really old wooden tables that are really heavy. Again, here's a, another picture of our tables and computers. Um, and then here's a picture of our back area with some students kind of studying in the back. Um, and we have a lot of, we don't have a huge collection, we kind of keep it lean and mean, um, but we have a decent sized collection of uh, everything from nonfiction to popular fiction to manga to graphic novels. Um, so the library has, their strict sets have been steadily going up, so that's good. Okay, so let's get into our presentation about uh, collecting feedback from students. And this is probably one of the most important things about the presentation is why feedback is important. And it incorporates your students' voices, um, specifically the individual's voice, but then all together as a chorus of voices too. Um, and it really incorporates that into how you, uh, how you provide services for them and how the library is structured. Um, it also makes the space feel more like their own um, when they get to have a say in how you do things in it. Um, and when you ask them how, how you do it, it, uh, it shows that you are thinking about how they use the library too. It's not just something that you're uh, doing without any student input at all. Um, and it provides a feeling of ownership, which is definitely a big part for uh, this age group teens and students of this age, like having a place to call their own is a really big deal and making it feel like a place that they're comfortable is definitely a valuable part um, of having like a good library. Um, I had a little line here like, has your library got soul? <laughs> I don't even know if I can answer that, but getting feedback can help you find out about if your library has soul if, in it or if your library is um, needing something else to make it feel like it has more soul in it or just more of a place to, for people to, that they want to be. I'll probably come back to talking about this multiple times through the presentation, um, but it's a really big deal with how I structure library services is really try to incorporate um, student voices. 
So when you're presenting surveys and trying to get feedback, options are always good um, in every step of the process. Uh, for example, in this, for, in this slide, um, just talking about trying to seek feedback from students about a topic, sometimes giving them options and telling them what is possible is really helpful. Uh, for example, I've given, I've, I've done surveys before where I've asked people about the furniture and they'll just write back like, well, we need uh, some bean bags or we need like a couch. And those answers are, are good, but uh, the better surveys I've done have been where I've shown them pictures of specific bean bags, like a company's bean bags called Fat Boy makes a particular cool bean bag that I've, I've seen and I've worked with before or like the steel case company and all of their active learning furniture, finding like some cool pieces that you would really want to have for your library. Even if it's impossible for you to get them because they're out of your budget, it's still really good to show what those options are. Um, and you can think big. It doesn't have to be something you can afford right away, but showing people some of those possibilities is really important just because they might not normally look at steel case catalogs or um, be familiar with all the different types of furniture that are out there. Um, so that's one aspect of like presenting options uh, is really good to do. Um, this slide about building surveys again relates to having options again and doing things in many different ways to give you a lot of different answers, um, kind of like covering a lot of different bases. When I was writing this slide, I was like, oh man, I don't even know how to build the best surveys for collecting feedback, just because I've tried so many different ways, and I still am just trying out all those different things, trying to seek and find information the best way that I can. Um, but providing options is good. Like for teens and students, online surveys haven't worked that well. Um, if I try to send them a link to a Google form, <laughs> they will rarely fill that out. But if I have paper forms for them to write on, um, that information comes back to me right away. Um, if I'm surveying like professionals or other people, uh, other colleagues, sometimes a Google form will work better and, the, and it's just easier to do right away. So I guess, yeah, in short, options are good and learning about your audience is definitely helpful to see like how they respond to stuff. Um, Most of my presentation is going to be about getting feedback from students. I have done surveys with teachers too, and I do try to include the teachers as well. But I might even ask you guys questions at the end of the presentation about why do you think it's so different to get feedback from teachers um, instead of students? Because it's, it, it's a really different beast, and I, that one is something that I have not figured out yet the best way to find feedback. So for this presentation, I'll mostly be focusing on like students and really including their voice in the library. Um, so yeah, the way to structure your actual surveys, um, it's really good to have those questions that seek definite answers, but then it's also good to have some open-ended questions. Um, I'm also a big fan of Likert, Likert scales, which are the scales like you see at the bottom of this slide where you ask a question like, do you feel comfortable in the library? And you can s circle, you strongly agree or you strongly disagree, and then you just move on to the next question, which probably could be uh, answered much in the same way, like strongly agree or neutral or strongly disagree. So that's another option for doing surveys, which is great. So asking um, essential questions is something I've really been kind of obsessed with this semester is trying to figure out um, how to ask more essential questions and those are really good to include on surveys. They're, those are the questions that are more open-ended, they're more thought-provoking, they don't have just a single correct answer um, and they're questions that keep recurring over time. Um, so, hold on one second, let me see. Let me grab one of my surveys that I asked about stuff. Um, so, for example, an, an essential question could be like, if I could add one thing to Sachs Library, it would be that I actually, 
<laughs> again, I'm kind of obsessed with essential questions because I'm trying to use them as much as possible. Um, adding one thing to the library actually might be a pretty good open-ended question where students could write whatever they want to write about. Um, another really good essential question that has just been a great thing to ask people is what is something that the library adds to the school or to the community? In other words, how is it valuable to uh, the school or to the, the people that use it? And so that, um, that kind of forces people to think not just like of uh, beanbag chairs and cafes and stuff like that, but think about, oh, this is something that it's really doing for the library that is um, that, that I really like and appreciate. Do you guys have any questions about essential questions <laughs> or anything right now? Uh, I have my work cited at the end of the at the end of the presentation, and there's an awesome book that's out. Um, uh, I highly recommend it. And they have a lot of their stuff up on the web too. But asking students essential questions is it's totally the bomb. It works really well. Mm -hmm. um, nobody has any questions yet about what you've about your session. We do, just a comment saying that someone is glad that you also don't didn't know exactly how you're doing it. Um, mm -hmm. That you know, that you're just kind of going into this, and that's the thing too. Some people I think are afraid of doing these kind of things, any new things, because they're just I don't know. Jump into it. Yeah. And she says, if you want to find out how little you know about something, offer to present on it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. 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 Props. That's exactly <laughs> how I feel. Um, and it, it, it has been like a huge learning process. And, and I have learned a bunch of different ways of like how to technically do surveys. But I feel like, again, I'm always still learning like how to ask uh, a good combination of questions and making it something that's easy to fill out versus something that is like just hard enough to like get people to write a little bit more. Um, so yeah, and I'll show you guys the most recent survey that I sent out to people in just a little bit here too. Um, and someone did just have a quickie question. Um, they missed the beginning. Um, what is your um, FTE? How many students do you have at your school that you're working with? We have a little bit under 400 students and it's ninth through 12th grade. Um, and it's a small Catholic high school, a small private school in San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. So we have a really big range of um, of students, uh, like economic statuses and um, just where they come from. We have like about 50 international students as well. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty diverse school in that sense. Okay, cool. All right, go ahead. All right. So I'm going to jump to the next slide. Okay, so an official survey technique is giving paper forms, which uh, as someone who started out as a librarian involved with like lots of new media and new types of artwork, I was always like, oh, traditional surveys are so lame. I, can't, I, I don't know if I ever want to use them. But I've learned that you can never uh, underestimate the power of like a good survey that's just on one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It can be really handy. Um, so you can devise a survey. How I usually will do it now is I'll devise a survey on Google Forms or if you could use SurveyMonkey, just any type of like way that you can keep track of your information digitally. And then I'll make a paper version of that survey that, that is kind of separate from the Google Form. Um, I'll, re I'll retype it out and kind of lay it out so it looks good on the paper. And then I'll send out my surveys to people and I'll collect information and then I'll enter it in on my own into the Google form to kind of keep track of stuff. So that really helps me um, collect my data and keep it nice and neat but also it gets the paper version out to people, especially students who are it's much easier for them to just fill it out on paper. Um, so for paper forms I try to keep people's mind on the library and my example for that is, uh, let's see, my library is a very flexible space. And I know lots of libraries have that curse and or magic about them is that they're used for a ton of different um, events and activities and classes and programs. Um, so for example, my library about around twice a year is totally taken over for a blood drive. 
and I'm actually not even able to um, work in my library during that time because it, it's so small. So I'll use that day to send out surveys to people and I'll have surveys for students during lunchtime. I'll be in the hallways for passing periods. I'll even set up kind of right in front of the library doors where people are coming in to um, do blood donations or to donate blood. <laughs> Not blood donations sounds wrong. <laughs> um, so that kind of keeps people's minds on the library even when it's not functioning as it's like regular capacity as a just like a regular third place where people come. Um, so I highly recommend that if, especially if your library is used for multi, multiple purpose things. Um, if it ever feels like, if you're ever feeling like bummed out that your library is not being adequately used as a library, then do a survey during that time and really connect people to the space and try to see how they feel about it. Um, so that that's uh, something that we can do for that. Now I have a link on here. I'm going to open it up to the most recent um, survey I did. And this is just a Google form. This is where this isn't the paper survey I sent out to people. This was just the online version where I would collect my data. But you can kind of see like what the questions are. Um, the first part is all Likert scale and then the second part are just short answer questions. Um, like if I could change one thing about the library it would be or what does the library add to the school or what do you want to do at the library. Um, so for this survey I really was trying to think of getting stuff that was as concrete as I could possibly get with the first part using the Likert scale and then opening it up towards the end and getting other stuff. I did send it out to the whole school, so I did get feedback from teachers as well. Um, but like I said, the teachers were, it's just a totally different thing, getting feedback from the teachers. I don't know why it's so different, but I haven't cracked that. <laughs> I can't, I definitely can't present about that today. But um, I had a lot of students get it. Um, I would fill out this, I would take my paper forms and then just use this Google form um, to fill out the information and then go from there. Do you guys have any questions so far about that? Um, uh, oh, wait. Uh, oh, someone said, can you show us the questions? I think, is that what you had there? Yeah. Uh, or, okay. Um, go back to show you those. Oh, to scroll, oh, what you were showing, just to scroll through it a little slower so they can see what some of the questions were, yeah. So here's um, some of the questions that we did for the last survey. Um, Sex library is comfortable, or the library space is easy to use, and you'd have to just click on which one you agree with um, and then just move forward from there. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always more questions that as I finish it I was like, oh my gosh, I should have asked about specifically our 3D printer or specifically about um, Makerspace, but I just didn't get that into the survey here. And that's okay. <laughs> Again, if, if you can't hit anything, that's okay. Don't try to, um, don't be discouraged if you feel like you're not encompassing the whole entire feeling and whole entire um, part of your library. You can always start small and, and build from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to know, how often do your student, students get surveyed? I think ours get surveyed so much they get survey burnout. <laughs> oh yeah, I can see that happening. Um, when, when I was a grad student, um, at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, I worked in a bunch of the libraries there, and for instruction classes, we would always give surveys to people afterwards. And I, yeah, I could see how students might get burnout from that. For me, I do surveys about two or three times a year, um, and we start school in August and go um, up until the end of May. Um, so usually, about like two or three times, I'll do surveys of some sort, and it, it'll be a mix of like either. Um, these kind of like official paper surveys or I'll have like discussion sessions or I'll do more like okay I'm just going to do a bunch of info gathering on this one topic and try to get as much info from students as I can throughout this next week or so. Um, so yeah. Okay. Any other questions that you all have? Uh, are, do you have any statistics on um, return rate? Are you going to be talking about that? Like how many? Um, yeah. It's probably someone, about... Someone wants to know what percentage of your students actually are uh, 
Yeah. It's it's Just only about a quarter of students that get my mm -hmm. get surveys back. Mm -hmm. Um so that's why I also will try to ask people uh, in other ways to try to gather information that isn't just like a regular survey. But yeah, that's another drawback of the like official questionnaire part is that out of out of a little less than 400 students, only about a quarter of them will get it, give the surveys back. Hmm. So about 100. Um, so the return rate isn't that good. Yeah. Any other questions right now? Um, yeah, one more just came in that we'll, we'll toss at you while we have here. Um, have you done any focus groups with a specific student organizations? Do you have student organizations there that you could work with for that? We have um, we have a lot of student club. At our school, they're called student clubs, mm -hmm. and they range from like we have a tea club that meets in the library and makes tea from all different places around the world and from all different oh, cultures. Um, to uh, like the student council is probably the opposite end of the spectrum as far as like clubs mm -hmm. and groups at our at our school and I've never done surveying that's like club specific I try to just survey as many people as I possibly can um, mm -hmm. that might be a good way to um, hone in on some specific uses of the library like I, I could see surveying the theater department um, about how they would use the library or surveying um, uh, and uh, like even some of the athletics groups to see how they use the library too because we have some sports teams that after the library closes um, after hours around five or six after their practice they'll come in and watch film in the library hmm. so um, yeah, there's a lot of different specific groups that I probably could survey in that sense. Uh, okay, yep, that's it for now. Go ahead. Let's continue. All right, so let me go back to. All right, so here are some results from uh, the most recent survey of what people wrote, um, and these are just some of the open-ended results that people were talking about. Um, if I could change one thing at sex library would be music corner, beanbag chairs, board game day, rent out board games to study halls, and no final exam periods. Um, when you, yeah, you'll, if you're surveying teens and students, you'll often get stuff like places to sleep or places to nap, so that's always going to pop up. Um, but yeah, this just gives an idea of some of the results that people wrote. And oops, let me go back in. For the most part, they're pretty positive, which is which has to do with like just the whole vibe here at our school, um, but also maybe how I structured the questions too. So, uh, what does Sachs Library add to the school? The answers were a comfortable atmosphere for students to work, knowledgeable librarian, knowledgeable librarian, um, a place to quietly hang, a safe zone, creates an open and visual environment. As soon as you walk in the door, it's inviting. So those are all really good things um, that I'm really happy that people are honing in on and, and writing about. And then another question with some responses are, what do you want to do at the library? Write down as many of the things as you can think of. Um, so things uh, ranging from having a class based on books, stories, and imagination, to make it more open, get more books, <laughs> which is kind of a, um, uh, I mean, that, that's great feedback to have. It's like the uh, balance that you always try to strike in a library where you make the space open and usable, but also try to fit in as many books as you can, too. <laughs> um, chill, homework, socialize, talk to GP. That's me, in case you're wondering who GP is. Another 3D printer, more chairs. I want to go in and just do what I need to do. Color, paint. So uh, those are just some of the responses that people have about the library. OK, another kind of official survey technique verging on like the unofficial, but still I'd say it's pretty official, is running a discussion session. Um, and this session is usually really good if it comes with hot chocolate or uh, cookies or some kind of thing to entice students in to just like talk about stuff and see how they feel about things. And a lot of times you'll get um, more in-depth answers and deeper conversation about how they feel um, about certain aspects when they're talking with you and telling you things. Um, 
So when I first did this, I used a program called Catch, and unfortunately they went out of business, um, and I didn't take screenshots of it. Um, but Catch was a way for people to just connect with their phones onto um, a big projection screen, which is a really great way to include students' voice, voices and document it and record it. Um, other options that you might be familiar with that are slightly older but still work just as well are like Linoit or Padlet. And I even have, we'll go to a Linoit one down below and I'll show you that. Um, but it's, it's just like a way to make like a pop-up in action music video where you're collecting people's feedback and, and asking questions and then people can type in their answers and they see it appear up on the screen. Um, and these sessions will usually last for like 20 to maybe like even 15 to 20 minutes. I try to keep them pretty short. Um, and they're usually very good sessions. Um, if you ever run these with teens, don't be afraid of random comments like squad or future. Um, you do want to be aware of any disrespect, disrespectful things that do get posted, but um, you just have to be aware of that. So here's um, a lino at Canvas, and this is where you can click on a sticky note and type in your message here. Uh, and then you can post it and it appears on the sticky note page over there. And they're usually, you can make them public or private. There's lots of different settings you can do to change it. And it's, it's kind of clunky because it's, it's an older tool. It's been around for, I think, at least seven years or maybe, maybe even slightly longer. And their uh, interface has been only updated slightly during that time. But it still works um, if you want to collect people's feedback in real time. All of them. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, do you guys have any questions about using Linoit or doing uh, discussion sessions with people? Um, no, nobody's typed anything. Anybody has any questions? Use your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Type in there. I can see what you're typing, and I'll pass on to David and our other speakers. Um, I do like this uh, this uh, product. The interactiveness of it. It's very yeah. Very slick. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. I, I really wish the catch program was still around because that one was really nice um, where you just get sent students um, like a small code, uh, like a six-digit code, and they access it on their phones, and then they could type stuff into a board right from their phones. Um, I think you can do that on Linoit too, but it doesn't look quite as nice on your phone. Um, so that was having the added aspect of like them texting their answers to the screen was really cool and they like were really into it. So we do have a question about this and this does uh, makes a good question here but how do you and someone else says they're not exactly sure how do you connect with the students um, how do you schedule this time like when they would be doing this is this something that's always interactive when you're all yeah. there using it at the same time or is it asynchronous where you can put something up and then they can come along whenever they happen to be I will usually schedule them during lunch times um, okay. and let people come in when they're having having lunch and then schedule it like for our lunch periods here are about 25 minutes so I'd schedule it for them um, to come in during that time okay so you pre you tell them ahead of time I'm gonna be doing this at this particular time during lunch yeah yeah how do you communicate that to them I'll put up posters around the school. I'll put it in our school announcements. Um, I'll also just ask people, like during, like right before the event is happening, like, "Hey, we have hot chocolate for a discussion session about the library. Do you want to come and check it out?" And that's usually a really good way to get people in. Um, again, like I would say, this hits more people. I could probably hit about half of the school this way. Um, wow, but it doesn't hit everybody. Um, but, but I'll do it over the course of like a week and just have them running every day during lunchtime and get a whole bunch of information gathered from that way. This is an app that they do, can use on their phones or their devices? Yeah, Linoit, I believe it does work on a mobile device. I haven't looked at it on the mobile device in a long time, um, but that that's what I would suggest is giving them a link so they could just pull out their phones and then connect to it right that way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Cool. Okay, All so right. go ahead. 
here are some of the um, results of the discussion session here. <laughs> this is when, okay, before I go to that slide, this is also a, a time when I was trying to make surveys more visually interesting because I thought they were really boring and really like just trying to change up how a regular questionnaire would look. And I think what I think that was kind of pointless looking back at it now, but you'll see on these next pages like why, why is the text all warped and stuff? It was just me trying to like change up the traditional survey thing. So we'd have these discussion sessions and then we would also have these uh, I would ask students questions. They would give me feedback on the Linoit screen or on catch on the on the catch screen, but then they would also fill out these forms as well. Um, so the questions are all warped. I apologize, they're kind of hard to read. Um, but then these are some of the answers that a student gives. Um, if you could add one extra room to the library, what would it be? I would add a special room just for classes while the library space itself is used for clubs or study halls. Um, what is something important the library needs? A serene environment. A library is a place for quiet study, relaxation, research, and reading. It has to have a calm feel to it. That's something that is also part of the like elusive balancing act of having a library, especially a small space like this library, giving it quiet space, but also enabling programs and activities to happen too. Okay, here's another result where the student just wrote down some answers that they wanted to on a post-it note. And this again is like being open to students writing stuff down in whatever way they feel most comfortable and having some flexibility with that. Um, so he, this student, he actually didn't write on the paper, he just wanted to answer a couple of questions using this post-it. So um, something, he answered question seven, which is what is something important the library already has going for it? And he said openness to new clubs, resources for whoever, um, uh, resources for whatever is needed for said clubs, and then if they would use a cafe in the library, and he said yes, I would use a cafe, coffee, tea, hot chocolate, breakfast, snacks, um, fair prices, maybe student run. So again, that this slide is just to kind of uh, show you and suggest that you want to be open to how students write down their information and take what as much that you can get, even if it comes on like a little post-it note um, attached to a piece of paper. All right, so. An unofficial survey technique is, um, pardon me, while I wake you up from your nap. Uh, sometimes we have students fall asleep in our library. Um, it's a high school library. It pretty much is a given that students will fall asleep in here sometimes. I usually will try to wake them up and say, hey, you can't sleep in the, in the library. And then later on during that class period or later on during that day, um, if I see the same student, I'll be like, hey, so what do you think of the furniture in the library? What do you think of this chair that, that you're in? just to kind of like see what they think of it. Um, and they'll say, it'll range from stuff being like, um, it's okay, I wish we had more of these other chairs, or I wish we had more chairs with like the swinging side desk things, or I wish we just had a couch to sleep on. But asking that question and connecting with the student at that point is really important and crucial and really um, makes the info gathering process easier on you where you can just talk to students um, easily and ask them like a question kind of on the fly. Um, and again, this is something you don't have to try to ask a huge overarching question like what do you envision for the library? It can be something like, hey, I put up these new lights. What do you guys think of these new lights that are up in the library? And they'll be like, oh, I like them. or they don't really light up the library very much. They're kind of dim. It's kind of dark back here still, just like anything. Um, but those little kind of questions and ways that you can connect with students um, is really important for building a good relationship and really opening up you to get more uh, feedback from students. Um, okay, so even another prospect of doing really small everyday info gathering. I was just uh, commenting on Twitter about some of my uh, practice as a librarian and um, I wrote a tweet that said my first year as a school librarian has been mostly about making designing and experimenting with space and then I had a student that had just graduated that year who 
wrote back to the tweet saying, and what a kick-ass job you did. And I was like, oh, that's really nice of you to say. And I was like, oh, that's really good feedback, too, because you are aware of, because um, they are, because they are um, looking at um, how you're doing stuff in the library and trying to connect with you in, in all those ways. So, I, again, uh, going back to like the previous presentation about social media, I, I don't connect with any students while they're currently students at our school through social media. But then when they do graduate, I will um, tell some of them, like, hey, you should stay in touch. I want to hear what you're doing at the library or hear what you're doing at school and hear about your school libraries and stuff like that when you're at college. So this is an example of a student who has stayed in touch and um, has talked about stuff about the library. So just, again, it's just like being open to getting feedback wherever you can get it. Okay, so let me go back to. Does anyone have any questions so far about um, any of like the small info gathering or like the unofficial survey techniques? Hmm. Um, no, but I do like the idea that anything can be. You know, a lot of people, I think, think of surveys. I have to sit down, figure out, figure out a bunch of questions, put together some official document or something online. But anything can be considered, as you have here, the everyday info gathering. Any conversation yeah. you have with one of your patrons or students, take what they say. If you can't remember, go back. Like I would say, go back, write it down. So you, you know, if you didn't obviously have something in paper, you were just chatting about you know, the chair they're sleeping in. <laughs> yeah. Write yourself a note to remember. Oh, so and so said they didn't. This you now somebody said this chair was not the best for studying. Right. <laughs> so I do yeah. like that. Yeah. Just think anything can any interaction. Right. And here in our library, again, this comes apart with the library being a flexible space and having so many different things happen in it. If I move around the furniture to accommodate um, a special program or event, I'll ask the students then, like, hey, so what do you think about the tables up here? Or what do you think about having them in this different um, arrangement? And they'll tell you for sure. Um, I've never had a student say, like, I don't care, Mr. GP. However you want to do it is fine with me. They always have something to say, and they always have opinions. Um, so that is another, that's just another like opportune time to connect with people and ask them, what do you think about this? Um, and surveying about space stuff, I don't know why I always latch on to that, but it's really easy for me to, I guess, um, say, like, this is where you literally are. What does this space feel like for you? Can you tell me about um, how you, how it makes you feel, uh, just stuff like that. So yeah. Mhm. Mm Absolutely. All right. Cool. Go ahead. So the last thing I have is kind of like a bonus feature, and it's about writing music playlists. And this comes again from like me making zines and trying to connect with students and really include students' voices in the library. Um, is throughout the year I'll collect music playlists um, for from students and post them throughout the library or make a zine and post them that, in that way. So here's a display of our current music playlist that are up. And the, the theme of the playlist was songs that saved your life. And the template can be, it can be uh, very open. Um, you can connect, you can get playlists that have to do with times of the year or if there's a big dance coming up, songs that they should play at their dance. Or you can just have it be more generic, like songs that saved your life. Um, pretty much teens understand uh, how to fill out a playlist without um, any directions. They're kind of like the less instructions you give, the better they turn out, because music is just who they are, and it's a way to like express who they are. So I, I take that and put it up in the library to kind of like make the space more of theirs by displaying uh, the songs that they like. I'm not this. I'm not playing the music. And I'm not posting like the lyrics to stuff. So I do tell students like it's okay if your songs aren't the clean versions or whatever, because we're not playing them in the library and we're not like posting the lyrics on the wall. We're just posting the the song titles. Um, if there's like a bad song title, then I can uh, bleep it out or take out some of the words for it. But I've had never had any any troubles with that at all. And students really appreciate the ability to just put whatever they want to. So that's another good way to connect with people um, in a small way, but that really helps you get a handle of what your students are like. Um, 
so I did make a playlist for collecting feedback. That's part of this co the the um, presentation. Um, the full playlist is listed on my slides on here, and I did try to build a Spotify list for it as well. But there were some songs that weren't on Spotify, but that's okay. Um, but there, you can click on the link if you are a Spotify user. Um, you'll be able to go to the playlist from there once the um, slides get published on the um, Big Talk for Small Libraries website. And um, yeah, do you guys have any questions about collecting music playlists? That that could be a whole other presentation right there, but um, for right now, <laughs> yeah. it's just a little bonus feature. Yeah, now someone does say that's a great idea though to collect that kind of thing, absolutely. Um, and using things like Spotify is very easy to share and, and whatever the students have, have uh, submitted. Yeah, I don't often make a Spotify playlist. I usually just post them in text form and that's kind of like usually how far I get and that's good enough. Um, They'll just take that and then find the, song, find the songs themselves? Um, well, to use. I pretty much like for this particular presentation I made a Spotify list of, of my playlist but usually when I collect student playlists um, I, I usually don't have time to, it takes a long time to actually type up the playlist and I usually don't get as far as building my own uh, Spotify version of their songs. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping, I've had a student volunteer work on it sometimes, it hasn't always come together but <laughs> that's on my list of things to, to make happen eventually. But like I said, it, it, when I just have the list of songs posted, um, I don't have to worry about F-bombs or like explicit lyrics or anything like that. That's true, right, yes. So yeah. it's a really good way around that. And I know a lot of people get worried about that um, in their library, like, oh, what would you do if you had that stuff in your space? I'm like, well, it's not exactly in the space because I'm just posting the song titles. Um, but it's still, I mean, with teens and music, that's like really who they are. And it's like a great way to like have, have who they are be posted in the library. Mm -hmm. Cool. Wow. Somebody did say they signed up for that um, Linoit, Linoit, how do you, I don't know if you mm -hmm. pronounce it, the, the yeah. surveys, and it does have an app that you can use, so you could use it, um, the students nice. could download an app onto their phone or, or tablet or device to use it that way and interact. So that makes awesome. it even easier, they could have it already pre-installed and use it from that. Yeah, oh that would be fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, okay, so I'm pretty much at the end of my presentation, I have another slide here, um, Feedback yep. for Life trying to always get feedback whenever I can. Um, although I ironically don't have any survey based off of my presentation on surveys, but that's okay. It's a lot of talk of surveys right now. I figured it would be okay if I don't have a survey at the end of it. Um, and then I have my work cited on here at the end too um, that just has a couple of links of information if you need it. So yeah, do you guys have any other questions or comments or ideas? All right, yeah. If anybody has any last questions they want to ask of David, um, type them into the questions section of the interface. Um, and I will mention you did say about the slides. Um, as we do every year with Big Talk from Small Libraries, um, the presenters will be sending me their slides or, or any materials they have, and they will be posted along with the recording afterwards. Um, and speaking of surveys, there will be an evaluation um, coming from me for um, the whole day of the conference. So um, look for that later. There's David. Hi, David. There I meant you are. to show you guys yeah. who I was <laughs> earlier, but I, I'll do it at the end of the presentation. But hi, hello. <laughs> there it is coming through. Yep. All right. Anybody? Somebody has this is just some great ideas. Thanks so much for all the all the tips. Awesome. Else? All right. Well, you guys know where to find David, and as I said, the the recording and his slides and everything will be up um, for you to reference uh, later as well. Oh, right. um, here's someone does. Yeah. Oh, somebody does have a question here. They just typed in. I'll get in the last second here. Um, has anyone surveyed public library teen patrons? Now you're at a school, of course. Um, yeah. As, the, as you were talking about, though, I was thinking a lot yeah. of the things you mentioned because it is teens um, would yeah. definitely apply to a public library situation. Yeah. So I did. I have. I worked for three years as a teen services librarian in the public libraries here, um, oh. the San Antonio Public Library System, at um, about four different library branches, and I did survey teens at public libraries too. Um, 
it was really good to have options to show teens um, when I'd be serving them. Like I said, kind of in the beginning of the presentation, I wanted to get feedback about furniture and what they wanted to have their teen space look like. And the generic answers would usually be like, we want beanbag chairs and we want comfortable seating. But if I would show them actual pictures, um, then they would write back like, oh, we want the campfire couch from Steelcase that you showed us. Or we want right. those specific items from Fat Boy. And that really helped because it, it's just not something that they were familiar with as far as like all the different pieces that are out there. And yeah, they're not really going shopping for furniture very often. <laughs> yeah. So and they, they thought it was cool, too, because they were like, whoa, they're showing us, like, really cool stuff. This is awesome. And it, makes, it would make them really excited, too. So that's when I would do more of, like, the discussion session surveys, where I'd have, I'd have a projector and a screen, and I would show them images um, on the screen. And then I would have, like, paper things they could fill out, but I would also just collect what they would say about the, the, the objects or the items or questions as well. Um, I would, even with public libraries and teens, sometimes I would even just print out images and show them during um, after school times when, when students would be in the library. And I'd be like, hey, so what do you guys think about this teen space being turned into a different type of teen space with these particular pieces or like these things happening in it? And that was also really effective to actually have the, the pictures in hand somehow it was really, really important. Cool. Um, we do have some of the people that did reply about doing the uh, teen programs. Um, someone else says they have done it um, using the old paper system, but she, she says, I thought these options were nice um, to try and change it up for the, for the teens in the public library. Um, and yeah, someone says, from the list of books that you gave, <laughs> which one are, would you think is the really good to use? You had your list of resources there, or... Which one is the best? Is there one that you'd say the best? I have like the Essential Questions book, which is really good, um, especially in a school library setting if you're teaching instruction sessions or even like an academic set library setting teaching instruction. Um, getting to those essential questions is just, uh, it's not easy for me, and I really want to try to keep doing that. So that that's kind of something I've been obsessed with lately is trying to include more essential questions and the balancing act of that and other things too. Mm -hmm. um, but then I have I have a book on there too about zines. I think it's called The Newsstand. And it's just like a collection of zines and stuff. And I look at that for inspiration because it includes so many things that people just do and put together kind of like quickly and easily and not worried about making mistakes. And that's another like huge part of getting feedback is just like don't worry if it if it's there's a mistake with it or if it's not turning out to encompass your whole grand view of everything can just have something that's small and start with that. So yeah. Okay, great. All right. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm going to... Okay, cool. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was great. <laughs> yeah.